So we have um, three speakers this evening, and our first two speakers have just returned from Homeward Bound journey this year. Um, so we have Dr. Sarah Hamilton, who's a geographer and climate change researcher in the Faculty of Science, Medicine and Health. And Sarah is co-director of one of our research centres, the GeoQuest Research Centre, and academic director of the Spatial Analysis Lab Laboratory at the University campus. Her BSc was in Environmental Sciences from the University of Southampton, and she has master's degrees in Marine and Environmental Science, GIS and Remote Sensing, and a PhD on Red Sea and Seychelles coral reefs from the University of Cambridge. She sits on the Council of the Australian Coral Reef Society and co-funded the Women in Coastal Geoscience and Engineering Network. And our second speaker is a PhD student who I've known for a long time, and I think I probably taught in first year, <laughs> Rochelle, <laughs> and third year, uh, Rochelle Velez, who's a, third, a PhD candidate in molecular biology at, the, um, at IMRI, the Illawarra Health and Medical Research Institute. And her work focuses on understanding Alzheimer's disease by generating brain cells from patient skin cells. And as well as her love for science, she's a practicing artist and with a bachelor's degree in creative arts and a very talented artist at that. And our final speaker is, is, an, is a cand PhD candidate, another PhD candidate in biological sciences, Claudia uh, Klopkoff, and she is doing a, a PhD in biochemistry, and she's aiming to go on the homeward bound journey um, next year. She's also at IMRI, the Illawarra Health and Medical Research Institute, where she investigates a protein which protects from Alzheimer's disease. And along her personal journey, Claudia was inspired by strong female scientists to advocate for women in science. Um, so I'd like to thank Sarah, Rochelle and Claudia for the preparation they've put into doing this talk this evening, um, among their many other professional and personal pursuits. And I'm really looking forward to it. And without further ado, do pass the stage to Sarah. Uh, so I will talk a little bit about, uh, elaborate on who I am and just tell you how why I ended up doing Homeward Bound. So uh, I'm what's known in the academic business as a mid-career researcher. So that means basically I'm more than five years out of my PhD. I'm eight years out of my PhD. I came here from Cambridge eight years ago. Uh, that means uh, I've actually spent 15 years working in my disciplinary field, which I deem to be conducting spatial analysis in uh, different coastal environments. So it might be working on mangroves or seagrass beds or Primarily for me, I actually work on, in coral reef environments, so being in Antarctica was quite a novel experience for me. Um, so most of the work I do starts with a map. Um, imagine, uh, I imagine most of you have seen sort of aerial pictures of various different coastal environments from above, and they tend to have spatial patterning going on in them. Um, so most of the work I do seeks to explain those spatial patterns. An obvious local example for Wollongong would be I work out uh, in the Five Islands Nature Reserve. And the Five Islands have got a lot of kelp beds around them. And uh, I can write models that would explain the distribution of kelp on the basis of the water depth and, and wave energy and things like that. And why is that an interesting or indeed a useful thing to do? Uh, <laughs> good question. Uh, lots of small invertebrates and other uh, useful things like weedy sea dragons live in kelp. And um, if we can think, say, forward uh, 100 years, where things like wave energy and water depths are, are, are going to be noticeably changing, that means that we can map what we anticipate kelp beds are going to be doing 100 years from now and, and, and have a, some insight into the uh, implications for things like invertebrates and weedy sea dragons. OK, so I've essentially ended up where I am now in terms of my job by following this simple formula. If I like something, I'll keep it in my life. So I combine my passions, essentially. So some of my passions being scuba diving. How many of you here have scuba dived? Excellent. And how many of you have scuba dived on a coral reef? And have you... Keep, keep your hands in the air and, and expressively wave your hand around if you've enjoyed the feeling of weightlessness and, 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 and beauty and vitality that you can see on a coral reef. Yes, this is the feeling we're looking for tonight. Okay, so that's one of my passions, and that's why I, I uh, get out several times a year and go and dive coral reefs. I enjoy boating, uh, hence the trip to Antarctica. Uh, I really enjoy spatial statistics. How many of you enjoy spatial statistics? <laughs> <laughs> no way. <laughs> hey, 
we got one over there. <laughs> Fantastic. And I enjoy mapping as well. So there's a, there's a certain creative aspect to my, my work where I bring all of those things together and I get a real buzz out of it. And so my main research focus is on coral reefs. Uh, and the thing that, that brings me around to the thing that, that got me on, on Homeward Bound, which is, uh, I'm sure most of you have heard, the Great Barrier Reef has had two mass uh, coral bleaching episodes in the last couple of years. So in 2016, 2017, um, it was hit by some pretty big coral bleaching episodes. And uh, the reports are now that essentially half of the coral on the Great Barrier Reef uh, is dead. That's something that happened around about the time uh, one of our sons was born. And uh, I felt very much that this was something I ought to be doing something about as a scientist who works on, on coral reefs. But um, obviously, I was otherwise engaged and, and I felt quite impotent in that respect. And also, as a scientist, somebody who's been, uh, I guess, spent the last 10 years modelling the effects of climate change on reefs, I very much sort of felt, oh, great, well, that was going to happen. We told you as a scientific community it was going to happen, and now it's happened. And uh, this is quite a depressing story, I suppose. Um, so that, from those emotions, I sort of took, tried to garner some energy and, and, and thought more broadly about how I can work in the world as a scientist outside of writing the traditional research publications and try to make a difference in the world. Hence, I decided to apply for Homeward Bound. Rochelle, as you know, and I won't deny that since I was a little girl, I have been literally dreaming of going to Antarctica. I was obsessed with the place. I would watch all the documentaries that I could. I was pretty much obsessed with anything to do with the natural world, and one of my other favourite things was dinosaurs. And so <laughs> you may be thinking, what do dinosaurs and Antarctica have to do with one another? But to understand dinosaurs and Antarctica, you need to understand science. So this kind of curiosity for the world around me as I grew up led me down bit by bit a path towards a career in science. Now, when I started my undergraduate degree at UOW, a long time ago now, I was mainly interested in the environment around me. But as I continued to go, I became more and more curious about the environment I couldn't see, the microscopic world. So I started to do subjects like molecular biology and genetics and followed my curiosity in that way. But at this stage, I was kind of just doing science because I found it incredibly interesting. I didn't really have a purpose. Then towards the end of my undergraduate degree, my Omar, who you can see here, she was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. And this led to a realisation of the power behind science. And I realised I could harness that curiosity to actually solve real problems that could help save people's lives. So eventually, that led me to take on a PhD studying Alzheimer's disease. So Alzheimer's disease, it is the most common neurodegenerative disorder, but we don't have any effective treatments and we don't have a cure. And one of the challenges for myself as a researcher, and there's quite a few Alzheimer um, disease researchers here tonight, is that to study the disease, we can't access living human brain tissue. We can't go around cutting out a chunk of your brain because you all need your brains while you're alive. So that's kind of difficult. But thanks to some technological advances in the last decade, what we are able to do is I can take some of your skin cells, they're just a small punch, much better than a chunk of your brain, and I can reprogram or change these skin cells, which you can see here, back into stem cells. So if you remember back to high school biology or you're not quite sure what a stem cell is, think of the embryo. And the embryo is made of stem cells. And from that embryo, you grow into a human. So the stem cells can grow into any cell type in the body. So what I can do with the stem cells I've made from the skin cells of Alzheimer's disease patients is I can then grow them into brain cells. So ultimately, what this gives me is living brain cells from someone who has Alzheimer's disease or a healthy individual as a model for the disease. And I can begin to understand what is happening to those cells. So I look specifically at the way they communicate and how that communication pathways are broken down. So for me, the reason why I applied for Homeward Bound is I've been incredibly lucky so far going through the University of Wollongong in that it's been a very supportive environment, especially for women. However, I hear horror stories from other places and Homeward Bound definitely, it was a echo chamber for many of the women of kind of the hardships they've gone through. And I know I'm gonna have to step outside of this bubble at some stage. And 
You know, I've grown up believe, knowing that women are no different from men and that we're just as capable and that we need to be working together. And when I step outside of kind of my UOW bubble, I want to try to affect those changes that I see working here so positively in the rest of the world. And as a scientist, you're not really exposed to many leadership skills or how to manage groups and people. And for me, this was a fantastic opportunity to start to build some of those skills and get it into my arsenal for when I continue down my career path. But I'll leave you and give you over to Claudia. My name is Claudia and I'm a second year um, biochemistry PhD student. How I came to the field of biochemistry was um, that in school I, I realized that the crossover of biology and um, chemistry um, really excited me. Um, I was thinking about our cells where we have all those different kind of things going on. There's proteins flipping around, processing some um, important metabolites. We have lipids building um, the barriers of our cells. And it's incredibly complex. Um, however, usually it works perfectly fine in all of us. However, um, sometimes things go wrong. And um, those things going wrong can lead to a cascade of things going wrong. And that, in turn, can lead to diseases like Alzheimer's disease or cancer. So I went through my biochemistry studies, um, interested, in, interested in all those um, different processes. And that has led me to studying a protein called um, apolipoprotein D, which you can see here. And this protein is protective in Alzheimer's disease. However, we don't really know why and what it's doing. So by understanding the structure and the function of that protein, I'm trying to understand the mechanisms behind Alzheimer's disease better, which, as Rochelle has already introduced, is a very complex and devastating disease. Um, I did my master's back in Sweden, and I, during my first year project, I had um, amazing female supervisors and a great team of um, researchers around me. And that made me realize three things. The first thing is, it's really amazing to see what fantastic science uh, women do, and it's great to actually have a few female role models. The second thing was, it's incredibly fascinating to do science and research. And the third thing for me was to realize that science can actually have a real influence in our world. And this is why we're here tonight, right? So let me take you through those three things. Firstly, why do we talk about women here tonight? Well, we all know that women make up 50% of our world's population, right? However, when we look at tables uh, where decisions are made, which affect us all, women are actually underrepresented at those uh, decision-making tables. So if we look at uh, women in STEM, so as Sharon said, that's science, technology, engineering, maths, and medicine, and we look up the career path, so from undergrad um, uh, students all the way to professors, um, the, the further up we go, the fewer women we see, and that's represented in this plot here. So um, the gender ratio, as we go up the ladder, um, it drastically opens up, meaning that we see fewer and fewer women. And that's a shame, because that means we're ridding ourselves of having a diverse perspective. Research has shown that teams which are very diverse in terms of gender and also cultural background, etc., are actually more successful than teams which are very homogenous. And that means by missing out on females in leading positions, we're missing out on a great diversity which could lead to um, decisions which affect us all. Now, the second point, why do we look at science? Well, I looked it up on Wikipedia just because I wasn't sure what science actually meant. According to Wikipedia, <laughs> it says that science is an enterprise that organizes and creates knowledge about nature in our case. Now, what does that mean? Well, firstly, it means that science can tell us about why things like climate change happen and uh, what effects does that have on the Great Barrier Reef, for example. Um, or it can tell us why some people get Alzheimer's disease and what we may be able to do about it. Or thirdly, it can tell us why a certain antibiotic drug doesn't work against a bacterial infection anymore. And that's really important because it brings me to my third point. It means that science can actually have a real influence in the world. Because as we make decisions in governments, uh, companies, and also here in a research environment, 
it means that science can lead us to decisions which actually affect us all um, in a way or the other. And it's great because Homeward Band is about exactly those three things. Homeward Band has been founded by Fabian Detner and um, a team of hers. And the uh, vision of Homeward Band is to equip a thousand women over 10 years with skills in leadership, visibility, um, strategy, and to form a network. And what that means is that we get together online, we have monthly video calls, we do certain leadership di diagnostics, um, we, you know, we have fantastic discussions with other women, and we're also educated about science. And I have to check what I actually wanted to say here. <laughs> um, Exactly, so it's a year-long pr um, program, uh, Homeward Band, and in the end it culminates in a trip to Antarctica. And um, you have to imagine that ship full of women, 80 women, uh, going to Antarctica, which is quite an endeavor. Um, and you may wonder, why did I go to Antarctica? I mean, we, we could have you know, a leadership workshop here in Wollongong if, if we wanted. Um, but that's... That's not the point. Antarctica, Antarctica to Homeward Band is a very special place, and that's for several reasons. Um, Antarctica has a very fragile ecosystem, which is most affected by climate change, and as we're going to hear, you can see the effects of climate change there in, in reality. Um, it's a country where we don't have a, an adi um, indigenous people. That means we all in the world, as a community, are responsible for the effect climate change has over there, for example. And we're all responsible for what happens in Antarctica. It's also, and we're also going to see that in many photos, it's spellbindingly beautiful, and we have an incredible wildlife in Antarctica. And last but not least, Antarctica has ever since inspired researchers and adventurers because of its quietness and remoteness. And um, we're very fortunate tonight to have Rochelle and Sarah here, who will tell us all about those amazing things which can happen in Antarctica. And um, I'm going to hand over to Rochelle. Here we go. Thank you. Okay, so thank you, Claudia, for the introduction to the Homeward Bound program. And I know I speak for myself and pretty much the majority of the women that went on Home Abound that when we found we were accepted into the program, it was just like this incredible warm glow that you carried around in yourself for the next year, basically. And with this lead up, all of our, so the program, as Claudia said, went for a year and we were meeting online and we were having discussions. But as it got closer and closer to us departing for Antarctica, so we went from Ushuaia, which is at the bottom of South America, before we flew out to um, Ushuaia, everyone's like, what do you expect? And I was like, I actually have no ideas. Because try as I might, no matter who I spoke to who had been on the program, the trip, on the trip the year before, they wouldn't give me a straight answer. They're like, you'll have an amazing time, it's fantastic, leadership, all these kind of key words. I'm like, yeah, that's not answering my question. What am I going to do? And the reason they couldn't give me an answer, as we found out, is that the Homeward Bound program is an incredibly personal experience. And that was something I definitely didn't expect, how much it would affect me. And uh, what we were doing is we were doing a lot of reflective thinking and introspective analysis. And the reason behind this is that the tools that Homeward Bound would use was getting you to question who you are and why you're doing what you're doing to make sure it's in a synergy with your life. And so for some women, this was really confronting because all of a sudden they realise the institute or the job that they've been working for the past 15 years does not align with who they are as a person. So there were some very big kind of personal struggles that played out over this three-week period. And the way that Homeward Bound does this is they use world-class leadership tools, but they flip the table on how we apply these tools in that we apply them to ourselves first because their philosophy is if we are going to lead people, we need to know how to lead ourselves because then we can have real purpose and conviction behind us to lead us on our journey and the journey of everybody else. So one of the key tools that was used during the Homeward Bound program, and Sarah will talk about this a little bit later in the um, talk, is the LSI, or Leadership Style Inventory. And basically, this was an a diagnostic tool which allowed you to identify your thinking 
um, and emotional skills, basically, especially when you're in times of um, pressure and struggle. But in addition to the LSI, we also learned how to map our personal strategy based upon our core values, how do I increase our visibility, how to identify our learning style in comparison to other people's, and then how to communicate effectively to people that just respond to data, or say, people that want the emotional story behind a journey. In addition, we were given skills in how to coach our peers. So rather than just mentoring someone and saying, hey, this is what I think you should do, helping them discover their own pathway rather than just saying it for them. So all of this happened before we'd even set sail for Antarctica. So this was just in the first three days in Ushuaia. And by the end of that, I was emotionally exhausted, mentally exhausted, and physically exhausted. I pretty much spent three days just crying, hearing the stories of the women coming out and just the, the people around you. It was, I cry a lot, so that wasn't a big, <laughs> that wasn't a big feat, but I was crying a lot. <laughs> it is true. There was one moment I went to my, my roommate in the first two days. I'm like, I just need to sit in the bath for 20 minutes and just cry. And she's like, are you okay? I'm like, I'm fine. I just need to cry and get it out and then I'll be okay. So by the end of those three days, I was exhausted. So I was really looking forward to be able to finally set sail to Antarctica. So here is a photo of our ship, the Ushuaia, where we also left from, and a happy snap of our lounge. So this is where we did all of our program work, where we hung out. Um, it was kind of key to the whole Homeward Bound experience. And here's just a nice happy snap of Sarah and I before we set sail down to Antarctica. So once we crossed the Drake Passage, which is meant to be notoriously rough and one of the most treacherous stretches of, stretches of water, we were really lucky. We had the Drake Lake twice. It was flat the whole time. So Mother Nature was looking kindly on her daughters. But I'm going to be a little bit self-indulgent right now. And one of the things I was most excited about going to Antarctica was to see icebergs. I don't know why I was excited to see them. I just was. So when I saw this first little minuscule <laughs> floating speck of ice, I was like, oh my gosh, we're going to Antarctica. Not so big. Anyway, about probably three or four hours later, I then spotted this <laughs> floating outside. And I internalized my excitement for like five seconds because we're in the middle of like a really serious part of program. I was like, oh my God, there's an iceberg. Oh my God, oh my God. And then I got to the stage, I was like, iceberg! <laughs> program broke up. We all ran outside, took our photos because that was the first kind of sign that we were really starting to head into southern waters. That signal, the beginning of my love affair with icebergs, I cannot get enough of them. And it also signaled the beginning of the Homeward Bound program getting continually disrupted because Antarctica was just being awesome. So at this stage, we were heading down the east side of the peninsula into the Waddell Sea. However, our progression was blocked by a 14 kilometer long iceberg. So it was believed that this iceberg had broken off from the Larsen ice shelf, which is here. And that ice shelf made the news last year because a piece the size of Manhattan had broken off. And this was one of the first examples that us as a collective had of climate change in the region. So because this iceberg um, was actually so big it didn't pick up on the ship's navigation, they thought it was a cloud. That's how big it was. So with our way blocked by this massive iceberg, we then turned around and we started to head down the western side of the peninsula. Now this gave us the opportunity to visit a number of research bases. And I found this incredibly fascinating because as, you know, leaders in waiting, if you will, it gave us an opportunity to probe these um, research station staff and their leaders of how it is to function, as Sharon mentioned, in a small and isolated and closed community. And what I found particularly interested, interesting is that, you can see, we visited a lot of different bases and different nationalities, and how these base leaders kind of navigate the um, bigger geopolitical climate in a small region. Because the thing is, if you run out of fuel in the middle of winter, you better hope that you're on talking terms with your neighbors, because otherwise you're kind of, you're screwed. But the thing is, in the bigger world, you know, China might not be talking to the American base, yet they may be relying on them to make it through the winter. So it was really interesting to see how those kind of um, relationships played out down in this continent, isolated continent. In addition, we also probed them with lots of leadership questions about what it's like to be a woman in science down in these isolated areas. And it was fantastic to see that when we were down there, a majority of the scientific research teams were 50-50 male and female. 
often the operations staff for the bases were more skewed between males, but there was definitely a lot of females on base. So it was fascinating getting that insight into how it's changed over time. Now, in addition to landing at bases, we also got to land along a lot of the Antarctic islands and on the mainland of the continent. And this allowed us to get up close and personal with a lot of the wildlife. So when we first arrived on the ship, I would not have known the difference between a chinstrap penguin or a gentoo penguin, but within days we were all experts. That was except for when it came to seals, and in particular the crab eater seal. So there was this one moment where in our um, dining room and someone kind of lets out this huge scream, we all run to the window and you can see this lone little penguin getting chased across this huge ice shelf by this seal. We all assumed it was a leopard seal and that it was dinner time basically and we were about to see blood and guts and carnage and there's women going like, I can't watch, this is horrible, oh my gosh. Then one of the resident Antarctic experts was like, guys, relax, it's a crab eater seal, they eat krill, not penguins. It's probably just lonely and is looking for a friend. <laughs> We're like, oh, okay. <laughs> so the wildlife out there was just spectacular. And if I had my way, I would just spam you with all the photos. But I have a time limit, so I'm going to move on. Um, in, ad in addition to doing the base landings and seeing the wildlife, we also had four to five hours of program content, that leadership program that we were here with in Antarctica. So one of my favourite parts of the on-the-ship um, on program was what was called the Symposium at Sea. And this was an opportunity for us to talk and share our science with the rest of the collective. And it was also an opportunity to practise our science communication. Now, you may think, you know, with eight, with, we were there for three weeks, you might know what everybody's doing, but a lot of surprises came out through that Symposium C, and it let you really understand the calibre of the women that we were on board this ship with. Uh, one of my favourite moments was when, um, so Professor Susan Scott, she's a professor in physics down at ANU, and she just casually slipped into the end of her three-minute symposium that her team last year won the Nobel Prize in Physics. So <laughs> even if you don't do science, you know the Nobel Prize is a big deal. And her roommate at this stage was just like, what? <laughs> We've been like sleeping together for the last 10 days and talking about albatross and you have won a Nobel Prize? Like how did that escape me? But the thing with that is that that's what home, the beauty of Homeward Bound was, is it wasn't about us as scientists, it was about us as women and connecting as individuals and then forming friendship. And that was really encouraged by a lot of the fun and formative experiences we had. So here you can see Sarah and I doing the polar plunge. Um, this was, yeah, fresh, <laughs> shall we say. Um, but you should, yeah, the, the kind of euphoric look on everyone as they submerged themselves into this freezing cold water and came out was, you know, it's, it's a formative experience. Here is me dressed as a T-Rex at our fancy <laughs> dress night because, you know, I love dinosaurs and why not? And I had a video, but I don't think it's working. Each night before dinner, we would have a silent disco on board the, the ship. So everyone would have their headphones on, put whatever playlist they wanted, and we would dance like nobody was looking for an hour, and it was incredible. <laughs> With this beautiful, you know, just Antarctica <laughs> casually going by past you. So up until this stage, you can see our journey. We're starting to head down into this place called the Gullet, and up until then, it had literally been smooth sailing. Smooth sailing. We were on cloud nine, we were connecting, we were having you know, this amazing leadership experience. It felt like absolutely nothing could go wrong. And now I hand you over to Sarah. <laughs> Can I just point out on the ship as well? So this is us working. We did, we did a lot of work. There were some days where I'd, I was saying to Sharon, I'd wake up and I'd, just, I'd have so much work to do. I'm just like, Antarctica, I really hope you're being calm. <laughs> because I don't have the energy to deal with how awesome you are. You'd be like, okay, I've got four hours after dinner to do all my homework, and then you'd spend four hours watching whales and stay up till like 1 a.m. to finish your homework. So we did work hard. Okay. This is where hopefully the evening gets quite fun. We're, we're gonna try an on-the-fly art-science collaboration. <laughs> Rochelle being our artist and, and me being the scientist and Claudia being the sensible person who brings up the leadership lessons learned from our collaboration. Um, so we hit, before we begin, we're on day 13 of the voyage. This was a 21-day voyage. 
And I sat down next to Fabian Datner for lunch that day, Fabian Datner being the founder of Homeward Bound, and she said to me, Sarah, we're halfway through the voyage. Things are going to start getting dramatic. And sure enough, by that afternoon, things had started getting dramatic. So um, we'll have a go at conveying the drama to you. Is this on? No, I might just move that. But I can move it. <laughs> <laughs> it's all about you, Rochelle. <laughs> okay. <laughs> In the spirit. I'm going to switch to blue. It says Rothera, to go or not to go. In the spirit of insightful reflection, we tell the story of Rothera Gate, a leadership development experience on the largest all female expedition to Antarctica. The expedition, involving 80 women from 13 countries, was the culmination of a year long strategic leadership initiative for women in science called Homeward Bound. Homeward Bound is an experiential program, and some of the greatest learnings emerged as we lived and worked together over three weeks at sea in this inhospi inhospitable and isolated place. Thinking is a key leadership characteristic. Our story highlights the different ways in which men and women think, particularly when making decisions. The accompanying leadership lessons suggest that global sustainability discussions, including things like the Paris climate negotiations, and the discussions of bodies such as the World Health Organization or the Food and Agricultural Organization would benefit from diversifying the styles of thinking they draw on. Rotherigate, the decision to head south, orca whales and breaking through the ice. Our story recounts a decision that was made while traveling down the Antarctic Peninsula to Rothera, a British research station at 67 degrees south. This was intended to be the southernmost point of our journey and our presence there was a very special occasion, as not many Antarctic ships make it as far south as Rothera. They only permit two ship visits a year, and ours was to be the final visit before the base closed for a two-year refurbishment. On day 13 of our voyage, within 75 kilometers of Rothera, we passed between Adelaide Island and the Antarctic Peninsula into a narrow passage known as the Gullet. Wind and waves had blown icebergs into the passage blocking our way south. Our expedition leader announced that a difficult decision had to be made, whether or not to continue south to Rothera. Under other circumstances, for example, a tourist passenger cruise, a unilateral decision would be made by the captain and the expedition leader. However, given the rather different and unique aims of our journey, this decision was handed over to the Homeward Bound organizational team known as the faculty. They, in turn, passed the decision on to the participants. <laughs> An inclusive and supportive discussion among the 80 women assembled in the lounge of the ship followed before a vote was taken. Having voted overwhelmingly to carry on to Rothera, a somewhat surprising ultimate decision was taken by the faculty not to press on south. <laughs> Many were severely disappointed, despite being slightly reassured, reassured that the well-being of the individuals had been prioritised. The following morning, we cruised across Crystal Sound in Zodiac inflatable boats while pods of orcas crisscrossed the bay in search of prey. Our disappointment of not reaching Rothera evaporated as we laughed and scrambled with our cameras among icebergs. Somehow it seemed that our shared purpose had forged a bond based on mutual respect, consensus and understanding. Upon returning to the ship, our captain and expedition leader let us know that the swell had died down, conditions were good to head around the outside of Adelaide Island to Rothera after all, and the ship was leaving imminently. We whooped for joy and wound our way south. The visit to Rothera was a success, and as we left the station, a nearby icebreaker ship reported that a change in wind direction had meant the gullet was clearing of icebergs. It was now possible to use the strengthened hull of the ship to cut a path back north for our return voyage revisiting the moving sheets of ice that had prevented our passage from the other direction. The next 12 hours were spent slowly zigzagging forward across a mosaic of sea ice, interspersed with slushy, fragmented ice covered in telltale frazzle crystals. These frazzle crystals were a sign that the ice was on the verge of freezing solid. With a small amount of headway made, we watched the ice close in quickly behind us, wondering for how much longer our captain's nerve would hold, and the tension on the bridge was palpable. While our safety was never in question, we came dangerously close to a stuck ship and a recovery operation. 
Recognizing the power of nature as we finally broke free the following afternoon, we stood on the deck enjoying metaphors about breaking glass ceilings. This was undoubtedly the most adventurous moment of our voyage. So what leadership lessons for STEM have we here? Our journey offered many op opportunities for reflection and learning. Over the three days that our story unfolded, we talked over the dinner table in small groups as a collective group, and we even workshopped the event, looking for meaning in the twists and turns of what had happened. Although the majority of the women in the room had voted to continue south to Rothera, enough people had expressed discomfort with the idea to change the plan. Our first lesson highlights the difference between informed and participatory decision-making. While the former accounts for the views of a group of people, the latter is more like a typical dem democracy, and it depends on those views. Some decision-making tools, for, for example, the Maya Briggs Z tool, weigh the needs of individuals against those of a collective group, and conventionally, if 35% of the people are unsure about a given action, their needs must be accounted for before moving forward. We also use the lifestyles inventory chart, which you can see here, uh, to reflect on our individual thoughts and feelings in the moment that we had voted. We were standing on the corresponding constructive, passive and aggressive behavioural styles on a twister-like mat, and this helped us to see how our thoughts had guided us towards a desired outcome. A complex picture of multiple responses within individuals emerged. Scaled up across the 80 women in the uh, room, these played out as a tangled psychological web aptly captured by the tangle of bodies on the chart. Many of us reported a swing from competitive or achievement behavioural styles, which would underpin thoughts such as, I want to achieve the visit to Rothera Station, towards seemingly contrasting humanistic or encouraging and passive styles. These would underpin empathetic thoughts, such as, well, if I don't go, I'm going to be disappointed, but if we all go, She's going to be miserable and uncomfortable and seasick, and that is much worse than disappointment. Once voiced, anxiety can be an influential and persuasive force among groups of women who typically show greater empathy for emotions such as fear. Even though they were widely reported afterwards, the competitive achievement sentiments found little voice in the room at the time of the vote. They were largely eclipsed by empathy for the well-being of others. It's ironic that the dramatic push to 67 degrees south and the adventurous return journey through the ice on our largest all-female expedition to Antarctica were ultimately determined unilaterally by two of the highest ranking people on the ship. They were experienced, gracious, brave and modest men. Given that they had been directing our movements for the entirety of the voyage up until this point, this begs the question, why didn't they just make the decision to push forward to Rothera in the first place? While a unilateral approach would undoubtedly have been more efficient, with the benefit of hindsight, such a directive would have meant that the women of Homeward Bound would have missed out on a key opportunity to come together. At times, this was a messy and angst-ridden experience, but it allowed us to build a sense of cohesion and strength through adversity. We collectively enjoyed the excitement of orcas and the catharsis of breaking the ice, and this raises an important question about leadership. How many leaders who habitually utilise purely expert opinion and authority as a basis for a decision, regularly get acceptance, but miss the opportunity for true ownership, engagement, and perhaps even a better overall outcome than a longer, more unwieldy, but ultimately co more consultative approach might generate. So perhaps the most important lesson from our story is the value of diversity in the decision-making process. Different decisions call for different leadership styles. Compared with their male counterparts, research suggests that women, together, are a little more collaborative. And this was reflected in the purpose, consensus and empathy for the discomfort of others shared by the 80 women. This in turn informed a consultative decision not to go to Rothera, which was then followed up by a more directive decision based on the expertise and authority of our captain and expedition leader. The two decisions together meant that we could have our cake and eat it. We had empathised, we bonded over orca whales, we reached Rothera Station, and we smashed the ice on the way home for good measure. In a world of pressing scientific agendas, perhaps the best gains are made when men and women bring their different leadership styles together. When women are able to sit at the STEM leadership table in equal measure, perhaps the sustainable future we aspire to might just be within reach.
And that, my friends, is rather a gate. <laughs> So the journey to Rothera was, as Sarah has just outlined, incredibly formative and it gave us the opportunity to witness firsthand and start implementing the leadership skills that we had been using. And for me, it was a perfect example of why Homeward Bound should be in Antarctica, despite how remote it is, is because you can't, you can't workshop that in you know, a conference facility at UOW or somewhere. It's the randomness of the environment that really puts the pressure on people to come out um, with this experience. So, where to from now? What is the outcomes of Homeward Bound and what are we all doing as we continue on? So, as Claudia mentioned earlier, Homeward Bound, it's a 10-year initiative. So, each year there's 100 women that go and we fold into the next so that within 10, year, 10 years there will be a global network of 1,000 women in science who have been through this program and have been upskilled with leadership skills. And from our cohort, there's been a number of collaborative groups that have branched off from this and are trying to implement the changes that they think need to happen in a number of ways. In regards to the Homeward Bound program directly, one of the groups I'm involved with is increasing the economic diversity of the group. So one of my, I get, I, daily I have many kind of light bulb and realization moments from Homeward Bound. But one of my kind of more recent and bigger ones has been really seeing my privilege as a woman in Australia and all of us being in Australia. I know what privilege is, but I didn't really begin to understand that until I was on board this ship with women. Again, I've been incredibly lucky and I've traveled to many countries across the globe from all ranging um, economies. But when I was in Homeward Bound, there was a lot of Latino, Spanish, and Chinese women. And in the last couple of days of the trip, they made this really interesting graph, which compared the average earnings of a mid-career Australian scientist to an average earnings of a Spanish scientist. And there, we were 16 times above the Spanish scientists. When you compared that to Uganda, where one of the participants was from, we were 600 times the average earning of a, a scientist there. Now, the program costs $20,000 Australian to go, so it's a big personal investment. I'm a PhD student. That's pretty much my average annual income. Yet I was able to raise, through the generosity of a lot of the people here, enough money to be able to go, including donations from the University of Wollongong, thanks to Sharon. There was enough money within our economy to support my place. But I was one of the few PhD students there. And of the PhD students there, we came from Australia and England. There was no one from China. There was no one from America because they don't have the economies su to support that amount. So one of the groups I'm now involved with in Homeward Bound is trying to increase that economic diversity by approaching corporate sponsors who will hopefully provide scholarships so that people from all walks of life, not just cultural diversity but economic diversity, so that they can come. Because it's often these countries that don't have that economic strength that need women in science championing the effort and that diversity of um, leadership skills and problem solving. In addition, I am part of another working group and this is to develop essentially a scorecard for workshops and conferences all across the world in regards to their gender diversity. So if you go to a conference and there's a panel and you see that there's all men and no women, which myself and my lab members have been witness to. We were at a stem cell conference a couple of years ago, early career researchers, 60% of the audience were females, and yet the panel was males. And of course, all the females, their first question they wanted to ask is, how do you manage life with family and a child with research? And the men, thank, to their credit, were like, as soon as we realized we were an all-male panel, we went straight to the organizers and said, this isn't okay. So we want to develop a scorecard and a toolkit so that conferences and workshops can, one, be held publicly accountable for not increasing gender diversity, but so that they're also in access to um, networks where they can ask, hey, we need some more female speakers on this. Do you know any? And then we can put them in contact with that. So there's these actual real tangible problem-solving solutions that the women from Homeward Bound are trying to implement in the rest of the world. Personally, my main priority is finishing my PhD. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I just have to put my head down and focus. <laughs> um, but like I do a lot of extracurriculars and they are really, it's a, it's, a, it's a balance. My extracurriculars motivate me for my PhD and it's my PhD and my love of science that motivates me to do things like, PA, um, like Homeward Bound. So without the two, um, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing because it's, it's who I am. In addition to that, one of the personal realizations I had coming from the Homeward Bound program is kind of what I just touched upon, is this continual personal in, um, in community engagement on a bigger side. I love science and I love communicating science and I think most people are really interested in science but they don't know how to engage with it because it is, it's a foreign language. A lot of the time I'm lost in that foreign language. So for me, I find having an arts background, art creates a way to translate that scientific language. It can be a bit frustrating when you've spent you know, six months making this amazing graph for your PhD and in the end, it's just a graph. Well, <laughs> well, if you are able to communicate that through an artwork, you can then initiate that emotional response with individuals, and then they'll become hopefully interested in the science and the incredible science that underlying that. So here are some photographs from a collaborative work that I did with my father, who's in the audience last year. And this was through an initiative in Western Sydney called CoLabs, which was exactly that, bringing science and art together. And so the sculptures here, which you can see, were made from immunostaining images, which I did as part of my PhD. And then you might have seen in the slide before these dancing chromosomes that I had. That's where your DNA is kept, um, your identity, essentially, um, provided the inspiration for this work that you see here. So from Homeward Bound, I really kind of clarified that I want to continue engaging in art and science rather than keeping the two separate. Because for me, they're two sides of the same coin. If you look at children, every child is a natural scientist and every child is a natural artist. And it's somewhere along that pathway that they kind of disconnect with that curiosity. In addition to that, I am also chair of the uh, um, Australasian Neuroscience Society Student Body Committee. And in that role, that's where I will ha be able to quite literally translate the leadership skills that I have learnt through Homeward Bound to helping neuroscience <coughs> students across Australasia. So you can see here the team that I work with and they're fantastic students all across Australia and New Zealand. So for me, Homeward Bound is, was a really clarifying um, experience in regards to where I want to go with my future and then also providing me skills to help see that through. Thanks. So where to, uh, for me, from Homeward Bound? It's getting quite hot in here, and I can see a few people fanning, so um, five minutes to hold out, guys, and then we're almost at fresh air. Um, I'm linking three different tools that we uh, worked on in the Homeward Bound program uh, on this slide, and they're basically going to structure the next three slides for me, and then I, th I think we're pretty much done. So before we got onto the ship, we worked out what our personal values were. This is kind of Leadership 101. So has anybody ever done a leadership course or run one or written one before? In here? Yes. So you've probably done the personal values exercise where you've got this big deck of cards. There's about 150 cards. And they say things like integrity, loyalty. And you have to put them all out, look at them all, and pick out the 10 key ones for you. So, so we'd, we had a go at doing that, and then these ultimately fed into our own personal strategies. The idea being that the strategy that we put together is congruent with who we are as people, our own personal values. Okay, and this kind of feels a little bit exposing for me in the sense that I'm, I feel like I'm showing my diary entry or something like that. So, um, but, I mean, there were, there were three themes to the personal strategy map. There was self relationships and work, and luckily you've only got work here. Uh, so my purpose, to be the best person I can be and move through the world making a better place. In terms of work, for me, that me means making a difference through environmental stewardship. Uh, the personal value that fed into this from the bottom was passion, and we were allowed to pick out three priority areas within our personal strategy maps. For me, these were becoming a purposeful, focused academic, um, advocating for environmental issues through effective science communication, uh, the Australian Coral Reef Society and other channels, and also uh, innovating through uh, different collaborations. So the idea of Homeward Bound was that they would propel us forward with momentum into the world once we got off the ship. So these all fed into 
a personal 100-day plan, which Rochelle and I are still plugging dutifully away on. So the next three slides oops, are basically uh, relating to these different priority areas within my personal strategy. So priority one was becoming a purposeful, focused academic. So I chose to interpret this in terms of not necessarily the content of the research, but how I move around through my specific disciplinary community to make a difference. Something that I did in uh, March 2016 was I collaborated with um, uh, colleagues at the uh, University of Sydney in Macquarie, and we set up something that we call WICCHI, which is the Women in Coastal Geoscience and Engineering Network. It's gone international. We've got about 500 members um, over the last couple of years. And the first thing we did is we kicked off our network. Uh, we launched ourselves at the International Coastal Symposium. I couldn't be there that night as I was giving birth, but I do remember um, how old the network is as a result. Um, the first thing we did was we sur surveyed the participants at the conference, and then we, we put an online survey out as well to gauge a snapshot of the current status of um, gender equity in our, in our field of coastal geoscience and engineering. We had 314 responses. One of the things, we, we then wrote up the, uh, the results and, and the, summarized our snapshot of um, the status of play in um, geoscience, coastal geosciences. Um, we published that. But one of the key things that came out for me was the, that the area of field work is a big area of uh, discrimination for, for women in environmental sciences broadly. Field work is really key to the career of most environmental scientists in the sense that you need to get an opportunity to get out there and collect primary data in order to drive your research questions. So this basically boiled down to two things. There was a lack of opportunity to do field work. And um, if you were lucky enough to get out into the field, there was discrimination experienced while carrying out field work tasks. Four quotes I'm going to read to you from the survey. Uh, the first two uh, relate to this first point, the lack of opportunity, and the second two relate to the discrimination. I was banned from a field trip to collect information at one of my PhD research sites in Saudi Arabia. Second quote. As I fill in this survey, the corridor of the building I work in is lined with empty offices. My colleagues are out on boats doing their field work. I have a passion for coastal science, which is why I'm working in a university but I have dis a disproportionately large share of administrative, pastoral, and government's duties that keep me from engaging in my passion. I'm about to go to a committee of women doing women's work. Inequality is alive and well in my workplace. During field work, I'm not included in tasks that are considered more male oriented like heavy lifting or deploying instruments. I keep getting passed over for the nearest male who never seems to be closer to the instrument than me. I've twice experienced sexual harassment on fieldwork expeditions. So one of the things I'll be taking forward out of Homeward Bound for me is working in this area. How do we set up areas of good practice for women doing fieldwork in coastal geosciences? And the Homeward Bound expedition, I suppose, had a few common characteristics to the research I do. There were a few uncommon characteristics, the whole Antarctica factor, but Essentially, it was a group of people on a boat for 21 days. You lived together. Um, so some of the things that we did uh, on Homeward Bound that I'll take forward in my research expeditions that I run, uh, things like the ground rules that we established in Ushuaia collectively as a group uh, before we even set foot on the ship, and creating safe spaces for people to work in. So something that was really good um, was every day they would have, they'd start the day off with what they called open frame, which was essentially opening the floor to the participants and saying, how are you feeling with how things are going? Um, anybody got any concerns? That sort of thing. So at the start of June, I'm heading up the Great Barrier Reef with a group of uh, female researchers from Indonesia, and I'll be taking a few of those areas of good practice forward and hopefully writing about them to communicate them to a broader audience as well. Another thing that was a priority for my personal strategy map was advocating for environmental issues. Uh, Homeward Bound is really big on visibility. And one of the things I wrote before getting uh, on the ship, which I was pushed to do through the visibility channel of Homeward Bound, was about making a difference through our science. Um, how I've come to do this, I talked at the start of this evening about the uh, Great Barrier Reef and the mass bleaching. That's been something that personally for me has been um, quite difficult uh, to work with as a researcher. 
And I've been experiencing emotions, things like grief for the, for the loss of all of that coral, uh, feeling a bit demoralized. Um, and we talked about how we can take those emotions and, and garner action from them. So something I do is, and I've done for the last five years or so, is working on the Council of the Australian Coral Reef Society. Um, and the editor, as I was writing this piece, encouraged me to talk about, well, what have you actually done that makes a difference in the world? And um, so, so writing on this piece, it was very much a focus on the, uh, ab the Abbott Point uh, port expansion. There was a proposal, I don't know if you remember, in 2015 to expand the Abbott Point, uh, the largest coal terminal in the world. They were going to dredge a big channel into the port, and the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority had given their permission for the dredged spoil, all of the stuff that got dredged out of the seafloor, to, to be dumped about 15 nautical miles off the shore, which essentially was right in the middle of the Great Barrier Reef World Heritage Area. So we stood up. The, Great, the Australian Coral Reef Society represents a body of about 300 scientists in Australia working on coral reefs who um, have conservation of Australia's coral reefs um, kind of at, at the heart of their intent. And so we stood up against organised... Well, alongside organisations such as Greenpeace, uh, Get Up, uh, an indigenous organisation called Seedmon, and um, we actually got that in the context of climate change. So something that commonly happens to me is we'll get to about 10 o'clock in the evening in our house, and I'm going around the house, turning off the lights, getting ready for bed, and I walk into the kitchen and go, oh no, a bomb's hit it, nobody cleared up after dinner, at which point... The only thing that will give me energy to do the washing up is if I put music on. So how is it that I can feel utterly great at 10 o'clock at night doing the washing up when I'm exhausted, but listening to music, and it can be Beethoven, Schubert, it can be Katy Perry. Um, how is it that I can feel so great doing that? And can we take that power and, and, and harness it for good in relation to uh, climate change? And likewise... Um, Rochelle and, actually, Rochelle and I actually ran an art science collaboration on the boat. Every evening, um, we had participants working on their pages. We all developed a page. Uh, our theme was um, the heroine's journey, a voyage homeward bound. We had people um, drawing what it meant uh, for them to think about their home and building into their drawings how they were going to take the lessons they learned from Homeward Bound into their day-to-day -day lives when they got home. And that resulted in some really lovely artworks. Something that was interesting about that, so 80 women trying to get them to participate in our art project each night, it was a fantastic way to bond with people. I think you have conversations that you wouldn't necessarily otherwise have when you focus down working on an artwork. There was a lot of negative self-talk uh, in terms of people like Susan Scott, who uh, Rochelle mentioned earlier, I, I sort of said to her about five nights in a row, Susan, are you going to come and do your art project? Oh, no, no, my teacher at school said I was rubbish at art. And then off she'd go. Um, but the product just wasn't... I should say that she had a notion to visit it and we got everyone to bring a map from home, so where your home is. So most people brought a Google image of their local neighbourhood. Susan Scott brought a picture of the Milky Way because that's where she lives. <laughs> like, how beautiful is that? And that's such creative thought. Like, no negative self-talk. The broader context for the Art Science Project in Homeward Bound is that Homeward Bound is a 10-year program, and they're running a voyage every year. So every year there will be some science art project, and at the end of it there will be uh, an exhibition, a travelling exhibition that cu accumulates all of those um, pieces of artwork. And there were some really beautiful sentiments in, into the pages that we that were put together through that project that are going to be sewn together into a book. But I really, truly believe that um, although this is really hard work, particularly for me as a scientist, this is where I think the magic is going to happen over the next few years in terms of making substantive progress toward our um, scientific agendas. Okay, so that I think is where we're finishing up talking and I think you guys get an opportunity to talk to us. We want to thank all of the people who have been uh, at our backs and supporting us for getting over to Antarctica. It's by no means a small endeavour. I think it was $16,000 that we each had to raise. And the... Sorry? 16000 US. US. <laughs> and um, we, we really should be waving the flag for the university because they've been very supportive from different departments. Um, in that regard. Okay. Thank you.